Again, welcome. Solving the business puzzle. Our guests today are Sam Edwards and Bam. Uh, that is me. And my name is Peter Severi, Future Cannabis Project. We have Eric Randstadt and Tom Himes on the show as well. So um, I think the, the concept here is I'd love to have people, and, and you guys are our guinea pigs, who are in the cultivation game, kind of telling their war stories, warts and all, of their business journey to where you are today, how you got here, the pivots you made, uh, the shit that hit the fan moments, the opportunities you didn't expect that you jumped on and that paid off and then kind of your vision and strategy for the puzzle you see that you're solving going forward in your own business. So uh, why don't we kick it off with Sam and uh, we'll give you the floor. All right. Um, well, I'm, I'm pretty honored to be here uh, with Eric and Bam um, and it's my first time meeting you, Tom, but um, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say as well. Um, yeah, so I uh, started in Canvas like 12 years ago. Uh, dorm room in college like a lot of other people um throughout um 2010 through 2015 i worked full-time you know as an engineer while um while cultivating light depth indoor some large-scale outdoor um just you know doing what everybody else has kind of been doing you know just doing 70 80 hour weeks for years on end um and then i uh, started the Sonoma cannabis company and the aya brand um and really went pretty hard on the on the co2 extracts um, and yeah, it was really, it was, you know, that business has since failed. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was just a lot of, uh, struggles, trials and tribulations. We tried, uh, we had a problem finding any clean trim and in, in, in 2017, went back into cultivation, um, fires up in Sonoma County really affected us. Um, you know, I remember kind of one of the big things for me was, was looking at, um, what the future of extracts were and it was not CO2 extraction. Um, and, and seeing really what was going to happen in the future with, with extracts. Um, and then looking at, um, I remember one of the first like 40 acre farms I went down and saw in Salinas in, um, in early 2017. Um, and I was like, okay, this is what's going to be, this is what's happening. You know, there's the, and then, and I've always been, a, um, up here in Sonoma County, you know, we have a one acre cap right now. Um, and I've always been kind of like, for a while, I was like one acre was probably minimum viable business. Um, nowadays, I really think that, uh, you know, three acres, as far as when you're talking about outdoor or, or hoops is probably the minimum, um, minimum viable projects, project size to be able to make it through these next few years. Um, yeah. And as far as like uh, my outlook on the industry, I think, um, you know, it's going to be a lot more trials and tribulations ahead. I don't think the next three years are going to be, um, uh, rainbows and sunshine. I think it's going to be a lot of struggle and yeah, I'm just kind of ready to take that on. So talk, talk about, can, can we do like the post-mortem autopsy on Sonoma cannabis and Aya brand or the, yeah. Brand oh, yeah. and kind of like what, when you started it kind of talk about like the initial entrepreneurial successes you were having. Yeah. So, um, we, um, downhill, yeah. So like, uh, um, I had been dabbling in, in making extracts, um, and had like in late 13 had like precipitated, uh, precipitated out THCA and entered that in SoCal high times cup and did well. Um, and then, um, yeah, when I, I custom, you know, designed a, a CO2 machine with, uh, another, an engineer that had built one very similarly, um, we made some tweaks, made our first custom one. Um, and we were hitting, you know, six, 7% terpenes, um, on a, on a, you know, a, a version, you know, kind of fresh press cold extraction. Um, and so we were just seeing a lot of demand for and, our product. And um, this was what year? This was, uh, late 15. Okay. Yeah. And so in 16, we realized we were going to start to brand and go down that route because we saw wholesale oil prices tanking. Um, and without a brand, we couldn't really actually explain our, our value proposition of quality. Um, with the help of two other partners, uh, one of which uh, Aaron Bro, with which he went on to start Snow Pacific Distribution, um, he was our sales team. Um, he uh, launched us uh, into I think 60 shelves in three months, in uh, starting in uh, in June of 2016. 
Um, we kind of just uh, and, and under what brand name? That was the Aya brand. Okay. Yeah, and it was interesting because I uh, the reason that brand started was because um, one of my clients at the engineering firm has a very large marketing company, um, and I got us an in there, and um, we we got them to design our brand um, and you know take equity for that brand, which was really um, which was really lucky because just to do all that work would have been a half a million dollars with them. They had like a whole block and they launched Nest into four countries in, in 2017. I mean, they're a huge company. I knew the president of that company and, uh, and founder. And, and so I got us them to take on our project. Um, and essentially we just, um, one of the, one of, there's a couple downfalls of that, of that company. One of which was we held true to well, our- wait, 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 but, but wait, 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 before you get to the downfalls, t- talk about the ascent. So talk about kind of the early successes. So I assume it was what, flour pre-rolls and CO2 no, extracted? It was, it was, it was CO2. Or something or what were the- It was, it was just CO2 vape pens. Okay. And then also, well, then we eventually dropped uh, the um, extra virgin solventless uh, rosin. And then we also dropped uh, pre-rolls and the pre-rolls, I think uh, it was like mid to late 2017. Um, and it was really saturated at that point. We were looking at kind of like horizontal, you know, maintaining a certain number of shelves well and not uh, not servicing a bunch of shelves that didn't do well and were actually more expensive to maintain than what they, than what they earned us. Um, and so we wanted to try to expand our footprint within those existing shelves. And that's kind of why we went down those product lines. Um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was some exciting time. It was really hard to manage capital because we were all entirely self-funded. Um, and you know, when you're, um, trying to decide whether to buy 20,000 more cartridges or you're deciding whether to how much clean trim you can, you can buy or clean smalls you can buy. Um, it's just really difficult, uh, capital balance with employees and with, um, everything else that was going on. It was, um, it was, you know, just maintaining supply chain and accounts payable and accounts receivable was, um, was a very, um, was a very stressful, um, endeavor. So that, that we're looking at the product, right? The vape yeah, pen. Yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. And, and so talk about, I mean, you, you were on a few shelves, uh, you, you were doing all your own, sorry, let me get back to me. Hey, you Sam, you were, quick... cause one of the things, go ahead. Uh, just a quick question. Did you purposely stay away from uh, from flour, jarred eighths, uh, that type of product? Yeah, we did. Um, mostly because we viewed it as a uh, too, it had, it was too capital intensive to scale for us. Got it. And, and, and so talk about kind of like the, you, you talked about staying small in terms of not trying to be on every shelf in the state. You wanted to kind of keep those 60 accounts and, and you had revenue growth, right? Like it started yeah. out successful and you were, you were growing all your own biomass for. Expansion. No, we weren't. We weren't. We, we grew some, okay. um, but at the time, you know, we, in 2016, we grew past uh, what we could actually source of clean material. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we, you know, we'd run a first, we'd run, do a, for, a first pull, um, you know, op- crack the bottom of the, of the uh, condenser tube and send it off right for a test and it popped hot for Avid, Fluoramide or, you know, or, or Eagle. I mean, it's just, it was, and that, and that, especially in that time, now we've got the whole regulated market and everything, but in that time we were, stro- we were trying to stay 100% clean high terpene count and hundred percent pesticide free. And we never broke the hundred. We, we never broke that promise to our customers to be pesticide free. And to be honest, it was one of our downfalls. I mean, a lot of competitor brands, a lot of the brands, if we had just pushed all that out, that, that all of that product out to shelf, like much of our competitors did, we would have done really well. But at the same time, uh, that's one thing I can look, I can look in the mirror on that whole decision and, and really. Feel so, so, so they knowingly put a uh, tainted product out into the market to keep growth and momentum and market share. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That was, a, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to name any names about that, but that was, a, uh, I'd say at that time, uh, that, that was going to be my next question. No, no. I mean, it, all right. So, 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 
so so you i mean talk about the early revenues because i remember when i was listening to that podcast you know you were like and we within three months you had what, what was your monthly revenue i mean this these are exciting times you're like a two-man yeah, so, shop and you're um, generating revenue so yeah i think in the course of like 18 months i i'm not sure i think we of course 18 months i think we just only turned over like a couple million dollars so it wasn't huge. It wasn't like, you know, it wasn't, but, it but was, I mean, like you went from like 10,000 a month to 20 to 30,000 a month yeah, in sales yeah, and, a month very quickly. Okay. So a hundred thousand a month, that's, you know, not a bad trajectory. And then kind of what happened? I mean, not, now we're talking, now we're, we're starting to go back down the hill of success. And so what, what was the downfall? Um, in 2017, we um, went to actually scale to cultivate all of our own product because, or not all of it, but we, we went to went to cultivate as much as possible. And we, and at the time, our team had, we'd come from cultivation first. So it wasn't, wasn't something that we hadn't done before. Um, but we went to cultivate as much as we possibly could that we knew 100% would be pesticide free. So we wouldn't have these constant overheads of R of R and D tests and failures and the constant runaround with telling people that their, their shit was dirty. And then them saying it wasn't dirty and all this shit that would constantly go on during that period. Um, so it was, uh, we went pretty hard on the cultivation. Um, there was, a, we had massive fires, the Tubbs fire and, the, and the Valley, um, the, uh, nuns, nuns Canyon fire that year. That was like, I remember it was the Sunday night. I had a 20 person harvest crew come in the next day on, um, on October 8th for all of our early harvest. And um, my house burned down that night. Um, and so we, uh, yeah, I lost, um, we lost a lot of product that night. Um, I can't say that was, I can't blame it completely on the fire. Uh, we were having a lot of problems um, just from cash flow purposes, uh, accounts not paying us. Um, even back then. And we were also, we had, we, we couldn't, we were working so much in our business that we couldn't actually work for our business. So at that time we really needed to take on capital, take on partners. Um, I know my partner at the time, we were working with a investment group and uh, we were on the precipice of accepting like seven and a half million dollars of investment to buy um, some large property uh, for cultivation in Sonoma County and large property and uh, also industrial property for our, um, to get a type six license in, in Santa Rosa. Um, and we looked at it and we're like, holy shit, this market, this property we're about to buy is 35% over market average because it was peak prospecting years. And all we're gonna do is, tr is hand over our entire company to this investment group in less than, less than a year. Cause there's no way we're gonna be able to actually handle this. Um, and so we actually turned it down. Um, and that's one thing I, you know, um, we failed early versus failing later on, um, but we would have failed uh, either way with the way that that investment was set up and the way that that real estate was set up. Um, you know, uh, being a civil engineer in Sonoma County, I knew how long it really took to get a CUP um, and how long it was really going to take. And look where we are. A lot of people have, you know, gotten the CUP process, you know, uh, mid 2016 um, and are are still in that CUP process three, three and a half years later, still don't have a permit, still are just burning money on rent, burning money on properties. Um, so uh, in that situation, I'm glad that, um, that I left it. And so what, what was the business? So wh wh when did you finally essentially put the bullet in the company's head and kind of um. was it unanimous agreement? Like we just need to shut this thing down or... So I had, um, I had a really awesome partner. Um, and, um, even to this day, um, you know, he's just a really good dude. Um, and so what happened was essentially he had put more money into the company than I had. And, um, he, you know, I, I, I gave the company over to him because I was, uh, you know, I, at that time after my house burned down and everything in like early 2018, um, it wasn't going to survive with, um, with, it, it, it couldn't, it couldn't support me to, to pay me a wage like it had. Um, and so I actually just uh, signed over all my percentage to him um, and let him try to make it succeed. And, um, you know, he, he made a good run at it as well. Um, and uh, we tried to do some contract manufacturing stuff, but um, yeah. 
what were the big challenges back then to getting into more shops, to getting to, to, to taking those 60 sh uh, shelves uh, up to 120 or 150? Um, ultimately, you had to be able to make very good terms for the retailer. You had to be at, you know, net 45, net 60. You had to compete, you know, the, the customer education wasn't there. So, you know, we're trying to sell pens at, you know, a, a replacement tip at, you know, at $19.50, $20 per 500 milligram. Um, and, um, and at the time, you know, we were getting undercut all day at, you know, $12 for, for 500 milligrams for people that were, weren't clean. And, you know, and it was really difficult and the retail shops sort of just like, yeah, our customers aren't going to, you know, they're putting on way more than a, you know, they're putting on a 200% markup trying to sell a, a pen tip for, you know, for, um, 60 bucks. And it was really difficult to get, um, the velocity we needed at that rate. Um, I'm sure, bam, I know with, uh, with your, um, uh, you know, we, I think both, what would you get that? Was it 16 or 17? I think it was 16 where you got second and I got third in the Emerald cup. You so, oh, wait, yeah, let me unmute him. Uh, all right, bam, take it from the top again. You were muted. Uh, I said it. Yeah. In 2016, we took first and second at the Emerald cup. Oh, that's right. We took first and second. No, we took first at, at Chalice. We took first and second at uh, Happy Place. We took first, second, and third at the Santa Cruz Cup. We took first at the Stoners Cup. We, we crushed it in, in terms yeah. of the awards. And, and but, what cat? What category? Uh, CO two extractions. Yeah. And and we had a very similar story to Sam's in that we were meticulous about our sourcing. Never failed. I think when. When, when both uh, me and Sam placed at the Emerald Cup, there was three companies that didn't fail for something or the other. And, and, and that was the top five. Two was ours, I think two was Sam's. Yeah. And then there was a, a, another company that also had passed. And similarly at Chalice and Happy Place, we, we took first, but there was only two companies out of like, 12 or 15 that entered that that passed and and, and just quickly I, what 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 year was that 2016 got it and similar trends carried over into 2017 yeah yeah it wasn't it wasn't until july of 18 that um really that pesticides actually got taken off the shelf yeah but as far as as far as the, the trials and tribulations go I can relate to a lot of what, what Sam's talking about. Um, when you're really focusing on, on building a craft brand and you're putting your emphasis on quality, to me, it's not just about the quality of the product, but it's the quality of the supply chain and, and, and the healthy ecosystem for all people that are involved. We were really, we knew every single farm that we worked with. We knew every single farmer and uh, we made sure that we paid them what was a fair wage because we were farmers who, who started the company and and our goal was to to bring quality to the market and also to the supply chain because we came from the foundation that business should be good to all parties involved producers manufacturers uh retailers as well as consumers but we struggled with the same thing in terms of market penetration uh we just kept being undercut we couldn't compete with distillate, because when you're making like a high end CO2 extraction, you know, if, if you're if you're touching 15% return, you're crushing it. That's, oh, that's yeah. amazing. Oh, yeah. Crushing I think it. that was maybe the highest return that we ever had. And we had, you know, our, our CO2 was definitely uh, a lot different than uh, much of the other CO2 that was on the market. We had a single solvent extraction. We didn't use any ethanol. We didn't do any winterization process and our trim carts were testing between 10 and 15% and our whole flower runs were testing from between 15 and 30%. Um, I remember smoking those carts. That didn't necessarily translate into better sales, even with all the awards, even with all the recognition. Um, one of the biggest hurdles that we faced was just getting shelf space. If, if you weren't going to be giving retailers uh, a ridiculous margin in my mind um, it wasn't going to work and we couldn't compete with 
with this fluid. Like the the process of uh, of of making this fluid and flavoring it is significantly cheaper than taking award winning strains from award winning farmers and and doing a virgin cold press extract where you're getting anywhere between seven percent and fifteen percent returns. And, and and factor in the fact that we're paying our farmers what championship winning flowers were worth. Uh, but our, our goal was never to to make hand over fist profit. We just wanted to bring a high quality product to the market and find a space. But we had problems getting into more than 30, 30 stores. And there was a lot of brands, I'm, I'm not going to name name them, that were able to come in and undercut us by almost 50%. Um, and we were barely operating on a 5% margin, 10% margin at that time because because of the way that uh, our supply chain worked um i'm still very proud of the product that we made uh we we had amazing carts um we put an emphasis on quality over over quantity so one of the big issues that that, that we had faced was um a higher return rate because when we made our carts, we didn't use any epoxies or glues, which are what terpenes dissolve this. You can, there, there, there's a lot of information about this out there. But limonene, which is a high, which is off, very common terpene found in, in, in a number of, of strains, will dissolve epoxies. And so we tried to make a construction of carts that, that, that didn't involve many of these carcinogenic uh, agents. And as a result, we had a higher default, default rate. We warranted everything that we did. And our, our fault rate was never more than a two to 5%. But when you're operating on a, 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 on a thin margin of five to 10%, if you're lucky, um, that will make or break your company. Yeah. But, but yeah. I still don't narrow it down to that. From, from us, from a craft farmer standpoint, from a, from a small business farm to table type model, the biggest hurdle for us was getting shelf space. And some of the th hurdles that we had was uh, retailers wanted us to incentivize it by giving them a bunch of freebies and promos. And, and there was only a certain degree that we could do in terms of, uh, of doing that because again, you're operating on a five to 10% margin. How are you supposed to do buy one, get one free? all day long like yeah two days yeah, two, yeah. yeah two days a month they want to buy one get one it's like are you kidding me right so basically we're going to go bankrupt based on, on on promotion and i understand that some some companies very successfully leverage their market share into into corporate buyouts and, and that worked out wonderfully for some people right. but again that right. wasn't we were a small farmer collective uh, of individuals, this is something that I experimented with in my in my bedroom, trying to make. And, and, and again, our our focus was on craft, not so much the business end of things. Um, in hindsight, I wish that we had we had analyzed it more from like the, the business analytical mind. But I don't regret anything that we did because I know that we didn't compromise our values. Uh, and I think the, the 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 biggest hurdle for us is how do we I mean, even going into today's market? How do we maintain that that craft that craft feel and story and, 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 and history without getting lost in 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 the sauce of the retail and distribution world? I think that's it's a hard one to see. And and, and just listening to Sam speak now, mentioning how by your analysis. Jet, 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 just quickly, jet, Bam. Just quickly, Bam. Yep. Can, can you're, you're, can you hold the microphone up? Is that it at your neck? Where, where's hold the actual? Up. There's something around your neck. Is that your microphone or? Is this any better? Oh, that's that's <laughs> much better. Much better. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So what I was saying was um. And, and actually, just, like, j j just quickly before you go on, uh, what was this the product that you uh, launched in the beginning? Yes, that that, that was the product okay. that we launched. Um, 
So it was all like full transparency, name of the strain. We, we took a very like wine. Uh, I like, I'm a foodie and, and, and I like wine. And so appellation and origin and provenance are all like very important aspects of, of what I do. So we felt it was important to like label the strain, uh, the conditions of growth, indoor, outdoor, greenhouse, the season, uh, to capture the terroir and then name the actual farms that they they had come from. So all of our packaging included the name of the strain, the name of the farmer, the county that it was grown in and the season, just so that as we showcase, because I'm also a breeder, so uh, environment and, and terroir are all really big and important aspects to me. And it's, it's really interesting to see how um, an OG Kush grown in Santa Cruz in the wintertime tastes so much different than one growing at the same farm in the summertime. And I thought this was going to be a great tool to educate consumers. Cause for me, if you're, if you're a small farm trying to make it in, in the big market, the big, the most important aspect is consumer education. Uh, if you're producing a quality product, the big disconnect is that a lot of times uninitiated consumers don't understand, uh, what that quality means. Do they, I remember doing in stores and, and having to educate people on terpenes. People didn't know what, what terpenes yeah. were or how, how, how that affected it. And a lot of people didn't even think about like the pesticide. I, I thought after we, we took Chalice and we saw 15 other brands, 12 other brands fail for testing, that this was going to be the aha moment for consumers. And, and it wasn't. Don't, don't, nobody ever, I, I never ever in the history of, of, of being out there vending did I ever get a, a question from a consumer that, that involved the safety of the product and whether it contained pesticides or had it undergone that testing. And we put a lot of emphasis into that because we thought that that was an important thing to highlight. But, and, and, and it's interesting that like editorial staff at different magazines and, 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 uh, and, and different media outlets did promote those things. But somehow, even with all that media education campaign and our personal outreach, uh, it didn't translate to consumers. And to be quite honest, I didn't see the, the push from the retail segment to highlight those uh, those benefits or proportions. And it always made me wonder, um, is it really just all about the margin? Is it really just all about the margin? Because wh wh why weren't these retailers being our partners in, in, in the education of the consumers? Was education detrimental to their bottom line? And if, if education is detrimental to their bottom line? I mean, um, I, I think I, I can agree with that 100%. The problem that I saw, I and mean, I heard this directly from someone's lips that was uh, the owner of a dispensary. Well, if we, if we come out and, and say you're pesticide free, that says everything else has pesticides. So we can't even say that. And so the only, so it was just, it was a, like, and it just goes to show like that, like timing in business is more important than anything. I mean, you know, I, I feel uh, all the people that are starting companies right at, right at the beginning of this year and now COVID's happening, it's like they didn't have a chance. T timing is just like this, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, it's a force in and of itself. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Well, and it wasn't even well, an aha so, moment for the farmers so at that time. Uh, what, what do you mean? Well, what Bam was saying a minute ago, he thought that when the, when the test results from all these different events, not just Chalice, we all thought the consumers, it would be an aha moment for a lot of them, but it was barely an aha moment for the farmers as well, because this dirty process continued all the way through even to legalization. I mean, the BCC still has a list that comes out every two weeks and it's cleaned up tremendously, but it's not like it's... Uh, uh you know it, it's you know it's it's eradicated yeah Th that being said it's not always the farmer's fault and i say this because uh out of all the batches of uh, of stuff that we tested we only had failed once and as a part of our own due diligence 
that really stumped us because A, we know all these farmers, we visited the farms, we have like deep meaningful relationships with them much beyond business and there are friendships. And we knew that these farmers didn't participate in this, uh, in those kind of practices. And so I remember we spent umpteen dollars because we kept thinking that the lab was wrong. And we sent, we, we sent out samples to multiple labs and it was interesting that like two of the three labs that we had sent to didn't detect it and only one detected it. And we were so adamant about like knowing our farmers and that they, and that, that they didn't spray these things that we were insisting that the lab was wrong. And so the lab held their ground and said, no, we're sure of our process. We know that like, like this is, this is not working. And thankfully we had great relationships with all the labs and it was cool to get all the lab directors into a room where they discussed their tech and the two other labs actually wound up admitting that their process was wrong and they learned something out of that. And we found out sure enough that that one farmer had failed. And so then we took it even further and, and, and started doing more research. And what we found out was that he was a victim of one of his neighbors spraying and catching some drift. And it wasn't what, on all of his plants. It was only was, on. Was his neighbor another agricultural crop producer, or was he also a cannabis farmer? He was like, a cannabis was, farmer. Okay. He was a cannabis yeah. farmer who admitted to have spraying the substance that we had failed for. And you know, we we had a lot of our batches had come from this particular farmer, and none of them had failed. So it was extra perplexing to us, and kind of what was the motivating factor behind insisting that the lab was wrong. But again, due diligence showed, led us to the, to the truth. And, and we found that out. So I mean, long story short, sometimes when you're dealing with these kind of things, it's not always the farmer's fault. There are factors that like farmers can't control. Um, and oh, drift is drift. real. I get it. I mean, when I was hunting trim, if I saw grapes, I'd turn around because I knew it was going to be, if I see, I could see grapes visually from the driveway or from where the grow was, I hit a detect every time. I mean, there was no question about it. I mean, strawberries in some cases, it, when I was going through the Salinas Valley seemed to be safer than going near places in the hills that had grapes. And I would go to even organic farms that were surrounded by organic peppers and hundreds of acres of uh, 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 orga certified organic farms, but there were grapes in the distance on the hills. And sure enough, we'd pop a detect and it got really difficult for a while, especially in 2018, because the drift was everywhere and every, you know, everybody was trying to get in where they could. And a lot of the places that allowed cannabis had conventional agricultural, you know, practices either right next door or formally on the same site. Hey, Eric, aren't a lot of those grape growers also complaining about their cannabis neighbors? So what's up with that? Is the drift go both ways or what's going on? The, there's been studies done for traditional ag crops where they spray something in Salinas and because it was a foggy day, that chemical goes all the way, travels all the way to Fresno. And there was actually a, a case that went down um, about that whole thing because there is liability. I mean, drift actually can cause liable actions at times. Um, and so it gets kind of tricky and I don't know a lot of lawsuits that are actually happening because of it. I think it might be harder to track down than normal, but um, the drift is just real and you have to be able to plan ahead for that or figure out certain ways. The wells are contaminated in certain areas too. The traditional ag areas have, you know, didn't have to have backflow prevention devices put on up until about uh, 20 years ago. And in some cases, there's places that were using chloridane that was outlawed 30 years ago, but it still comes up in the well. And so you know, again, yeah, it isn't the farmer for everything, even though it was pretty easy to go to farms and find a bottle of Eagle 20 hiding in the corner um, at the end of the day. But, you know, even that eventually got cleaned up. But, um, you know, not a lot of people were doing micro extractions, too, to test the trim. A lot of people would buy trim and go on plant material tests and not actual oil tests. And so really, you know, um, you know, in 2018, I think was starting to be more of the time when people would do micro extractions before they would actually go buy the trim to find out what was in it. And then slowly after that remediation has become, you know, a, a business. That, that's a really important point because uh, in, in that example that 
uh, I, I cited just now where, where we involved the labs, um, we had test results from the actual flower and, and, and the flower didn't test. It was only in concentration that that drift did appear. Yeah, people would show me R and D right. tests all the time, and it would be plant material on the top, and I could never really do anything with an R and D test from a farm without going out there and taking samples, uh, sending it back uh, to the place where it got the micro extraction, and then that goes to the lab. And so it was really tricky for all the trim hunters, and you know, 2018 even because it started getting real cutthroat, where people were just, you know, going after trim like no tomorrow, and uh, you know, some people would COD or come pick up the trim based on an R&D, but then they'd want to return it as soon as they started finding out that it was, you know, contaminated with something. And uh, eventually people were okay with people taking samples and waiting two weeks to come back with the results to verify its cleanliness so that you could put a price on it. And depending on what had to be remediated or not, you know, also, and how much THC was inside of that stuff dictated the price that it, or the value of it. And, uh, it, you know, it, it was really interesting to see because, you know, a lot of the labs wouldn't have the same exact results each time. So then the lab shopping on the legal side became really popular, um, as well as the category three kicking in and the heavy metals were really uh, prevalent everywhere. But, you know, according to the people that make the oil, remediating the heavy metals is a lot easier than the other stuff. So just quickly, uh, Sam, let, let's pick up with your story and then bam, we'll, we'll go back to you from, from the top. But, uh, so in basically in 2018, it sounds like you, you, you put Aya to bed from your perspective, you walked yeah. away from it I walked away. and then kind of what happens next? Yeah, and then Cause you, you aren't defeated. Yeah. And then, um, my partner, uh, went to carry the torch, um, for a little while in 2018. Um, and then, um, I think he gave it a nap. He may bring it back to be honest. I know that he has the, he has all the marks. He has all the branding. Uh, I wouldn't doubt that, um, he could have what it takes to actually bring the company back, which would be really cool to see, uh, when, whenever the timing is right, as we talk about how important that is. Um, but yeah, I left that, um, um, yeah, we, uh, I got involved in a project, um, to, um, purchase, uh, bought a vineyard in Northern Sonoma County, um, went to go put in permits on it to do, go back to my roots and my, in cultivation. Um, my neighbors were some really wealthy, uh, vineyard owners. Um, they sued me, sued us. Um, and I, you know, I had it in our budget cause I, you know, when we raised the capital and stuff that we had enough money to sue ourselves into the permits. I knew we were legal. Um, we were good because of what our zoning was because I had previously done use permitting as a civil engineer. Um, and then um, we realized that I, it just wasn't going to be worth it for what it was. Um, and um, we sold the property for a nice little return on a one-year investment. Um, and, but yeah, it was, uh, that was like, that was like, we sold that in August 18. Um, and was that, was that to someone else who had the intent of growing cannabis on it or no, a different purpose? No. Okay. It's a, I'm sure it's a large, uh, you know, uh, second home to some tech, tech bro at this point. Um, but, uh, and then I, late 18, um, was just doing a lot of consulting for different people. I, what I really specialized in and I still do, um, is, um, because I've spent so much time doing real estate development, I can like walk on a piece of property and tell you basically how much it's going to cost to get a project done there and how long it's going to take and how much money, because what it is now is like, how quick can you get your return on your investment and then how quick you can scale that property and what's it, what's its total lifetime economic viability. Um, and so I was doing a lot of consulting on that. Um, and also aiding, helping a lot of other people get investment. Um, and so then I went to work for a private equity firm on the investment side. Um, and I, I just left there in February of, uh, 2020. And that was cannabis investments or, yeah, they, they're, I mean, they're involved in a lot of different investments. Um, they have a software fund, biotech fund, um, you know, they've played around in crypto and blockchain. Um, but I, I aided in vetting and um, working on their entire cannabis investment strategy. And, 
and what was the strategy you developed from an investor um, perspective? Essentially pulling together a lot of people that do the best thing at what they do into, into a centralized, uh, vertically integrated company, which at the end of 18, the way that, the way that we did our investment strategies um, from there, from the capital market side um, was, a, was pretty interesting. And eventually we got caught in the, um, in the capital crunch uh, in late 19. Um, and that actually, um, you know, they, they put a lot of money out, um, what, I, what, I, what they refer to as deal money. Um, and then ultimately um, did not uh, tranche in the millions that they were going to at the end of last year. Um, so that's, I, I mean, that's a big part of why, um, why I left in February. So Got I've it. read a couple of recent articles that uh, uh, investors of that scale are kind of huddled on the sidelines, saving up their money, building up coffers to come in and, uh, and buy stuff up uh, pennies on the dollar. Is that what you're saying? Um, no. Well, yes and no. There's a lot of distressed asset investors out there. Um, it's more along the side of like the way that a lot of investment works, like, you, you know, you, a lot of times you don't want partners, right? You just want to do a deal all by yourself. You're in hundred percent control. You have no one to answer to. It's just you and, um, and your decisions. Um, but that's not really a very good strategy. Um, a really good strategy is to diversify your risk. Um, make sure you get buy-in on valuation. So you're not coming in on an investment at too high of a valuation or too low of a valuation is fair. You're coming in um, in something that's a verified uh, valuation between two or three other, um, you know, institutional, uh, you know, whether it's uh, private equity, family offices, or actual institutional investors. Um, and then you guys all tranche in together to, to, to raise the capital that's required. Um, and not only does that pool, you know, not just capital resources, it pulls network resources, um, it pulls everybody into the same ship to all row together. Um, and that was, a, that was the strategy we were working under. Um, and ultimately what you, uh, you, you're, um, you're hoping that everyone agrees to the same valuation. And, and that, was, that was near impossible at the end of last year. Distressed assets, yes. The one problem that people don't realize about distressed assets is that um, you know, a lot of people are trying to sell licenses right now. And when people say, what is a license worth? Um, I usually say 50% of whatever the lease is. Because the problem is that when you say you have a lease, it's like, or you have a license. Well, if you own that property, there's carrying capacity to that. Um, if you have a lease, then you just have to, you know, like for instance, if, if you have a, a distribution license and your overhead is 150 grand a year just to keep the lights on, well, what do you have to make? What do you, how, much, how much gross revenue would you have to have per year in order to keep those lights on? About 3 million probably just to get your margin to then pay your rent. You know what I mean? Um, so at that point, then you're trying to stand up uh, an instantly a 3 million annual revenueing business within a year, which isn't hard to do if you have a whole lot of flowers and, and, you're, and you're good at what you do. But um, if you're an investor and you have no idea what you're doing, you're going to lose 100%. You're going to lose. Um, more investors have lost money in cannabis than what they've made outside, outside of the public markets. Um, but on the private investment side, it's pretty much been, been all losses from what I've seen. Got it. Okay. So in, in February, you basically leave the, the investment firm and kind of, I assume we're now up to what you're currently doing. So do you want to talk yeah, about so, um, what you're doing and your vision? The yeah, puzzle you're, you're putting together for your business. Yeah. It's like one of my strategies, um, since I've learned a lot of really hard lessons over the last five years, um, I always keep like two or things, just like two or three consulting projects, opportunities always like in the background. Um, so if whatever's happening at the moment is not uh, working out, there's always something to fall back on. Um, usually, you know, sometimes it takes two, three, four, five months until that, that next thing comes along. But, um, you know, in, in cannabis, it, it's really hard to uh, just be all in on, on one thing. And, you know, and, and now I'm, now I mean, I'm going all in on one thing. Um, but um, yeah, I was, just, I was consulting towards the end of last year, always um, on some very large cultivation stuff. Um, and really trying to gain that kind of mid-market gap um, that we're seeing in like um, in the in the flower market um, and the flower market like the, the when you look at data right now it's totally subjective to your understanding of what and, and what and how big the black market is because when you look at right now it looks like flowers are dwindling in market share comparative to 
bakes, edibles, the rest of new product developments and such. Um, but if you take the black market, if you, if you just rolled the black market data into the white market, flowers would still be just an absolutely massive market share, over 50% by, by far. And so there is, as we go on to conquer the black market, which we will not do through enforcement. Just, just quickly, just, just quickly, you're, 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 not, you're saying there's not a huge black market edibles? There, there is, but it pales in comparison to the, to the, uh, to the um, flower black market. Um, the one side about that is that as quality and price, you know, I've always said in, in cannabis, the one thing you will never change, you can regulate, you can tax, you can do this or that. The one thing you can never change is the amount of money that's in your consumer's pocket. And because of that, until there's quality cannabis at the right price point, with a lot of variety, available in a convenient location. That's the only way you actually tackle the black market. So from my standpoint, if you can scale through the mid market flowers, not the low end, not the high, like the high, you know, light assisted greenhouse that, you know, that Eric's probably producing a lot of that's really good. And I would love to smoke some, um, but more that mid market, you know, above like bottom barrel outdoor, which there's just going to be endless amounts of this fall. Um, but scaling can you within, define your terms with like maybe price points or, or something so that we can, yeah, like yeah. Interest, yeah. Uh, I think right now we're in the middle of the drought. I think it's a drought that like, I can't believe what, how bad the drought is right now. I don't know if you got, if you, Bam or Eric can acknowledge how bad the drought is right now. It's, it's, it's rough. On the um, black or the white? Both. Right. I mean, I mean, the, I think there's more on the licensed than there is on the unlicensed. I mean, yeah. even though they're both in a drought, I think the severity of the black market right now is is worse off than the uh, uh, licensed. No, I would agree. I would I 100% agree. Yeah. So there's uh, as far as quality, I'm like, I'm talking about like you know 23 to 27% THC, um, light green color. Um, decent nug size, you know, what's, what would be, um, you know, selling right now on the legal market, um, probably between like 900 and 1200, um, that market space. And then, you know, and that, that's going to, this fall, you know, that's going to, that's going to drop and it'll probably be somewhere between like 500 and 900 or so, something to based on, on, on strain and, and, you know, furthermore inequality. But then you have like all the really low end where there's not even a strain name on the back and it's, you know, that stuff's going for, you know, 250 to 450, you know. Which becomes the gamble at the retail side because then you're getting $25 eights that you can't see through. There's no sample to smell or anything. And so people are really, you know, pulling the, the gambling handle there on what they're going to get when they get back. And unfortunately, the consumers are, are burned. But the level of, you know, wanting to find good weed never stops. And so they just keep chasing down those cheap eights till they find a sweet one, basically, is what it looks like to me. Because yeah. Well, the, yeah. the, the $75 stuff is really, you know, I mean, a special market. Yeah. And it's and honestly, like this year we're seeing so many massive light assisted greenhouses come online and so many like really really good indoor growers that started you know on their projects two and a half years ago and they're finally turning the lights on right now because believe it or not if you want to if you want to open a 500 light grow you know that's probably about how long it's going to take from inception to real estate acquisition to turning your lights on and getting your first crop probably two and a half to three years and you know that so we're going to see like i i i I do not envy the folks that are turning on 500 lights of indoor to, and uh, hoping to get premium, you know, three, you know, 26 to 3,200 a pound for exotics this fall. I don't envy those people at all. And these mega facilities have some stumbling blocks. I mean, it takes however long to set up, like you're saying, and turn on the lights, but then it takes a good amount of the same time to really get their feet wet and get through some of those learning curves, basically. Um, there's not a lot of people in the greenhouse world that know how to run those big mega facilities and, 
and it comes with a you know some some painful learning curves basically a lot of them what i see do good on the first run because everything's kind of clean first shot but you know by the time it gets to the second and you know trying to facilitate their own propagation there's just uh, the learning curves just come from the left and the right and then these mega facilities that aren't used to you know the pest pressure and pathogen pressure that comes up it just it just man I, it you know so i mean in a lot of ways it takes some time before they're really gonna you know saturate the market let's say so eric do you think that cloning will like in the grape industry you know there's not a single large vineyard manager owner that actually does their own propagation every and they've tried i mean they have their own glass facilities they have their own french oak forests for their barrels but they the one thing they do not do is they do not do their own clones and i'm wondering if what if we're going to see in cannabis anybody like in the end say 10 years from now when it starts to level out be steady state and really mature is it all going to be outsourced cloning is anyone going to take their own clones that's a good question. I mean, the virus has a lot to do with that. It's not just pests and pathogens. The actual, you know, dudding or virus that occurs is a big, you know, knock in the teeth for, uh, you know, people that are trying to do it themselves. But if you look at, you know, like you said, grapes, or if you look at strawberries, I mean, you know, strawberry producers don't make their own strawberries. And those are all tissue culture because of the viruses and they don't really try to descend, you know, try to figure out what virus it actually has. They don't give a lot of virus names to strawberries. They just clean it up and move on. There's, there's not going to be this, you know, eradication of things. And that's what a lot of these, you know, bigger producers in cannabis that, you know, don't have big scale people on their team um, understand basically is that the eradication, it doesn't exist. It's more of a control factor. And so the nursery does, uh, potentially have a lot of that could be factored in, but at the same time, the nurseries are also spreading a lot of the problems that are really hard to deal with. And so it, you know, it, relationships matter and who you're working with, but I, I you know, there's got to be more tissue culture at a bigger scale that is, you know, more affordable at the same time. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the only thing I would, I would mention is that I don't think any, any nursery is going to survive that also doesn't have like a 10 or 20,000 square foot light depth on site assisted because I just have noticed that when you go to the nurseries that don't actually flower any of their own product out their 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 understanding of what's going on is massively lower than those that do they don't have enough clones they can't sell enough without you know spring is the hot time you know spring and second run depths or whatever and so as you go into winter time when you have that many people shutting down for the season you know the output just isn't there so basically they have to throw in some flowers but eventually when they get some good relationships going with some of these bigger facilities and things do kind of narrow down like you're saying you know and if we look into our you know, glass ball or whatever and say, yeah, maybe the future is nurseries supplying these bigger facilities that do go year round, you know, they do have a shot, but again, yeah. you know, we're just not there yet. And yeah, one of my, uh, one of my good friends, uh, sorry, go ahead, Ben. I was going to say, I think that's where a great place where room for breeders exist because right now we have a lot of strains that aren't stable. You know, it's like people are just, crossing two different strains. They haven't been IBL, they haven't been in bread line. So I think give it five years from now with a real focus on breeding and stabilizing important characteristics and traits, when you can have a uniform seed crop that, that produces a, a plant that's consistent enough to, to be put into the same bags for consumers, has key yeah. characteristics like traits, uh, like, 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 like smell, um, for yeah. uh, bag appeal and all that, isolated and locked. I think that becomes the more sustainable and um, long-term method. You don't have to worry about viruses as much. You don't have to worry about pests as much. And yeah. in terms of cost of production, you can't beat that, right? Yeah, one of the, one of the only and I, and I I agree with you. I think that is one one of the only issues. And I saw this spring as I've been trying to figure out what I'm going to cultivate this summer. And is that if you, even if you have two or three phenotypes in a, in a, in a seed stock, if you, if you are not extremely on it, 
with flagging those and harvesting together. It, you can actually fail POA for being kind of stuck on PMC content. Um, and so it's one of those things where, um, it, you know, it, it, like for instance, if you're doing uh, if you're doing 18 different phenotypes or 18 different cultivars, and you're doing half of those seeds or all seed, all of a sudden you have 100 phenotypes. And trying to what logistical supply chain standpoint of harvesting, curing, and taking to market 100 phenotypes is like I can't even imagine how difficult that that would be. So it's a, it's a if if we can get to that point in five years, I cannot wait for that moment because I'd much rather be growing seed than clone from a cultivator standpoint. Um, oh, oh, one thing I want to mention too, so one of my good friends um, is one of the largest get great nursery um, in California. And um, they have 400 acres of every one of their varietals. So they like have a 400 acre uh, vineyard management and they have every single varietal that they sell as a clone, just as a, just as a tender. So you can actually see them all being grown. You can see the grapes. You can actually get a bottle of wine from those grapes. And, but they don't, those 400 acres of vineyard management, they don't, that's not for selling those grapes. That's actually just for selling their clones. So I think it's going to be interesting to see, like, I want to see a large nursery that is, you know, is cordoning off an area so that you can see everything growing while you're, you know, and that is a place where breeders could really excel in that way. Yeah. Uh, I, and I think that five years is a realistic target. But a lot of that also depends on the regulatory framework. What has kept breeders thus far from producing that kind of seeds is plant counts and canopy size. And those are the, the, the things that breeders need as tools. They need volume because breeding is a statistics game. Right? And so the more space and canopy that's available um, to breeders, the, the sooner that we're going to arrive at that point. Yeah. I, don't, I can't say that I see the regulatory hurdles going away anytime. No, I'm, I'm honestly like, I, I don't know what is going to happen with federal legalization, but, but it's probably going to be another 3,000 pages of regulations. That, that's also kind of why I've made the pivot towards hemp. Um, because of- Wait, I'm in a, don't uh, go there. Wait, we're going to get okay. to that because I want, I want to give you a long, like plenty of time to talk about it. So, so, let, so let's, all right. So we're going to get to your pivot, but, uh, so Sam, it, it seems like you're going after kind of like the 20% of consumers who smoke 80% of the flower and are looking for value and at least good enough quality. I mean, obviously everybody would love to smoke the most premium, but, yeah. but it's an affordability uh, issue. Yeah. I mean, what I'm going for is unfortunately coming to the realization that quality doesn't equal business success, unfortunately. So it's, it's, uh, we're going to, and so we're growing a lot of product and, um, I want to grow the very best product I can. Um, but I also need to cut, keep my cost of goods extremely low, um, and be competitive in the marketplace. And so we're doing 100% native soil, not using a single bit of import soil. Um, and using almost all, you know, trying to do all biologicals, 100% organic, and really just shooting for an extremely low cost of goods um, in order to meet a good quality product and try to hit, you know, try to hit two and a half percent terpenes. Okay, and and so I don't know if you already said it, but where where are you building out a facility, and and how big, it, how many acres? Um... Yeah, we're um, we just got our state licenses last week. Um, we're up in Lake County. Lake County is allowing a lot of cultivation going on up there. Um, and um, yeah, we're doing some, uh, we're, we'll see exactly how many acres we do this year, but um, you know, it'll be, a, it'll be over three. And, and that gets back to your business viability that you need to be of a certain scale to succeed. Yeah. You need to be of a certain scale and you need to uh, you need to treat it like an ag business and not like a cannabis farm. Um, and in order to do that, you need to uh, really uh, analyze every input you're doing um, and not uh, be willing to change. Like I think the biggest thing is being willing to change your mind. Um, I started out as an indoor hydro grower. I went to uh, indoor veganics. Uh, then I went to um, outdoor organics. And I went to um, kind of more conventional uh, light depth and then uh, all organic outdoor. And we're going to stick with all organic outdoor now.
Okay, sorry. I, uh, we got family at home. Um, so, so where we're catching you is, and I remember when I last spoke to you, you, you were shopping nurseries for, I yeah. think, what, 40,000 clones. And uh, so d- did you pick up your babies? No, I haven't yet. Um, I, honestly, uh, what I like, um, actually, it's funny how like TG Genetics, or maybe it was Beard Bros, I can't remember the, the art of the pivot. So like what I thought I, what I, thought I was going to do in January, I'm not doing. Um, and what I thought I was going to do a month ago, I'm also not doing. Um, and <laughs> so, re- so, so, so can you tell us what you thought you were going to do in January and then what you thought you were going to do last month? I thought I was going to do like almost all seed in January. And then last month I thought I was going to do half seed, half clone. Um, and I had had, and I had my full, um, my full, you know, 18 different cultivars that I was going to do. Um, and now I'm not going to do either one of those things. Um, I, so, I have to ask, is it uh, finances, but also other factors that are uh, influencing your decisions? Um, I mean, it's just, it's just real-time market data. Um, seeing what everyone else is doing and, and really it's all like, a, it's like looking at all of the competition and jockeying to make sure that you're not going to be screwed in December and January. Um, because it's not that far away. Um, and you know, I was going to do a couple, you know, maybe going to do a whole bunch of autos and now I'm seeing everybody grow autos and have no dry space and the auto market's going to crash. And the, you know, and so, um, it's, it's interesting to see. And, and, and there's a bunch of people that already have, you know, that are, they, they're going to hit their cost of goods and they already have their supply contracts set up. Um, and they're going to be fine doing their autos, but I don't have those set up. So I'm not going to do autos. Um, you know, and, so it's just interesting to see, um, you know, what I don't, I think what, what's dangerous this fall is, you know, I, for, for those of us that have grown and been in many, many harvest seasons, um, it's, it's rough. It's always rough. It's always rough. There's always a massive glut. Everyone's trying to just pay their trimmers and buy Christmas presents for their kids. And it's gnarly um, from a market side. And so it's um, making sure that like, you know, I think it's kind of funny. I'm, I, I may, I'm, I'm not a set on this, but I may do a little bit of blue dream this year. I, I grew, I grew blue dream for a long time. And then I was like always hating on blue dream because it was worth four or $500 less per pound than, you know, than the, the OGs and other things. And now I'm like, I think I'm going to do some, I think I'm going to do some blue dream again. I'm not going to do too much blue dream. Um, so it's just really about like, it's funny because in the great world, people are like picking, you know, it was all the rage for all cab and now, you know, and then like a movie comes out and everyone hates Merlot. And then now, you know, and everyone's like, Pinot is going to be all the rage. And everyone just was, pl- was planting Pinot like no other on the coast. And now Pinot, there's a glut on Pinot. And um, so it's just kind of, uh, uh, there's a, there's the one thing that's rough about selecting your cultivars um, is how much is dependent on uh, outside marketing in, in, the, in the marketplace. Um, and, you know, whether, you know, it's kind of funny when you see like, like what is the market of the mid Zotics, right? <laughs> well, have you looked at that i mean with the dispensaries as far as like what sells the most and what varieties people really hit at in certain yeah. areas and markets compared to north and south because the like yeah when we were judging the emerald cup sitting next to joe and listening to his deal it's like he can't get enough blue dreams and hazes and yeah. you know daytime weed yeah and so, yeah san francisco loves its daytime weed la loves its nighttime weed um, I, at the same time, like I just, I just try to travel around the state and, and, um, and one of the things that I've noticed is like a lot of the distribution company, like if you're waiting on data from like headset or BDS or those things, like you're always getting data. Like, yeah, they have a, week, a weekly data that really comes out, but I w- if I didn't, you know, like where exactly are those dispensaries? How much was their sample size? How can you really extrapolate on those statistics versus like knowing the sales, the knowing the, the account manager that manages 20 sales reps and talking to him and having that relationship is like the most important thing you could have. And you can't just jump into that relationship. It has to be built over years of being in the industry. So, so on your uh, three acres, you, you had mentioned Blue Dream. So first of all, do you have hoop houses? Do you have state-of-the-art greenhouses built by Eric? Do you have, what do you have going on there? I think I, I, would, I would love to have state-of-the-art Hoop house, or state of the art greenhouses built by Eric. 
Uh, I'd actually talked to Eric when I first started this project. <laughs> um, but no, we, we haven't decided exactly how many acres. Um, you know, we, it may be um, far and beyond the three. Um, it may not. We'll, we'll just see it just quite yet because it's still early um, and we're still, um, we're still processing our soil. Uh, but it's, it's, it's going to be native full sun, uh, native soil full sun. Um, really, you know, that's like one thing I always talk about. We're, we're doing oh, products. sorry, sorry. So, so, so you're not using any, uh, any light depth or anything. You're, you're yeah. outdoor. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Right. And that's, you, it, you can only, um, it's, I think the future of, of cost effective, high quality cannabis is high hoop berry tunnels. Um, that's, I was just going to say that I can get a deal on some right now too. I got a, there's a farmer that's taking down a couple hundred acres and they're selling. Oh shit. Call me after the bear. show. Call, okay. me, call me after the show. <laughs> I'll send you a picture. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. That, that, that's killer. That's what I was going to say though. The berry hoops for outdoor on a couple acres like that. I mean, that's where I was getting some decent biomass for a little bit was on a 40 acres in Buellton most people saw it on the news after annual permits started coming out but yeah, i was going there when the temp permits were still active everything was valid but uh man they were they had more weed coming down that they knew what to do with but the berry hoops were great because they you know a, a economical approach to protecting some outdoor yeah and yeah it's interesting because i feel like with the, with i know it Eric, you and I have talked about this quite a bit. If you look at who's producing some of the very best sun grown in the whole state, you know, they're doing it in berry tunnels or, or they're using hoops and they're using a specific covering on their hoops. Um, I've talked to a lot of farmers this year that do full sun that are talking about like using a specifically, a specific type of shade structure this fall in the last three weeks of flower just to get the color because one of the problems you always have with outdoors is that um, your color can be a little darker and you can get some hyperoxidation and come March, you know, it just doesn't look very good. And, and you can, there's a lot of things you can do to get around that that are, um, that are highly effective. And what is the specific shade cover they're using? Well, they're climate screens, they call them nowadays. Most of them, I mean, people will still get the traditional shade cloth that looks like a mesh, but um, people that really know what's up are getting climate screens. A common one that people know of is called a luminette. It's kind of more of a climate screen. It has a mylar coating on the outside, so it's highly reflective. But uh, the stuff that I use uh, is, it, and it's common in a lot of the fancy greenhouses, the climate screens kind of have the white strips going through it with uh, the webbing in between holding these little white strips that, together. So that it's very breathable. And depending on how thick or how close together these little white strips are, uh, dictates the level of shading that's created but um, they really reflect light well and and work much better in some cases people prefer the greenhouse covers because they are trying to protect from late rains and things like that but other people that just want to get um, you know the the exposure down the late summer exposure on those flowers um, is really helpful because what happens is plants outside get exposed to uv and that infrared and at certain points infrared bringing the heat like that if it's not scattered by a shade cloth or a diffused greenhouse cover plants have to sweat they we per, people perspire plants transpire and so basically when those big dense flowers are trying to sweat moisture is trapped inside and so that's how we get bud rot and a lot of people want to avoid bud rot um, and the botrytis and things like that and so also keeping the color because cannabis or terpenes um, you know, are easy to zap off or oxidate, you know, UV, UVB is discoloring and degrading. And so while a lot of people, you know, argue over UVB or UVs in general, giving higher THC ratings, it really can be tough on the terpene content and especially the color of the plant. And so, you know, there's a lot of people I sold climate screens to last year that just did their hoops predominantly with the shade screen and had great success and said they'll never go back. And then I have other people that prefer, like I said, a diffused greenhouse cover. But when you use a greenhouse cover, the problem is most people trap too much air. They don't have enough openings to avoid trapping air. When you trap air, it heats up. We don't need the greenhouse effect in the summertime. And so using a greenhouse cover in conjunction with a shade screen doesn't always do the trick because then it's still shady and, and hot inside. And so there's a few methods to the madness, so to speak. But at the end of the day, yeah, berry hoops with a shade screen and a couple of them covered with the poly weave just to kind of do a little 
side by sides wouldn't hurt um, when you have that much square footage to do. And, you know, we can do a little cost analysis on, I think the shade screens, depending on the size would be more affordable than the, uh, than the poly woven greenhouse covers, but most people just kind of deflect to the films and then trap too much air. So they have too much exposure, too much trapped air, which overheats. And then they go, why did I get this greenhouse? Or I was better off outdoors. And so, um, you know, it, it's it, it, it's really important to get those colors and not have it look like outdoor. That's why I always try to call things sun grown and then see where the consumer or the person kind of asks from there. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see what, you know, there's, in cannabis, there's like so many different ways to skin the cat, and so everyone has their own methodology and, and, and such, and um, yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see what, um, what kind of proves out to be an industry standard in 10 years. So, so Sam, wrap, wrapping up with your, your story uh, up to present time, uh, so it's gonna be a couple acres, and then the cultivars you're gonna run, you mentioned Blue Dream, are you going to be running stuff that's kind of known in the market or you are like, what's your decision making process for the cultivars you're running and how many do you think you'll run in season one? Um, we could run, you know, we'll see. We may, we may end up doing like upwards of 10 acres. Um, and if we go that route, then we're going to go with, um, you know, uh, cult, uh, two cultivars per acre. Um, and it'll be, a, it'll be a mix of um, some tried and true, um, some possibly, um, you know, we'll, we'll see, but I, I, you, it's really hard to, um, gauge the market just perfect. And you also have to, when you're looking at these decisions, you have to look at them at a supply chain standpoint, because you can't have, you can't monocrop and you can't have your entire harvest come in at one time when you don't have enough drying space for it. So like, and, and pay and, you know, investing enough money to have enough drying space to dry your entire crop in 10 days is in, is astronomical. Um, it's just a, and it'd be a very poor use of capital. Um, you build, you know, building a multi-million dollar building for one week a year, um, or at most two weeks a year. Um, that would be a pretty, uh, a pretty poor business decision. Um, so having a rolling harvest, uh, you know, a five to six week rolling harvest is really important. So some cultivars that are eight week, nine week, 10 week, 11 week, 12, like just yeah. picking and shoot. Okay, got it. I got All a right. question. Do, do you have your uh, distribution channels uh, set yet? Or are you still talking to distributors? Uh, what's that environment looking like for you? And do you, will you go with one? Will you go with a few? And um, uh, what are those relationships? Those are important uh, factors yeah. if you're making your decisions, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, no, uh, we'll see what it comes out to be, but yeah, I, I can't imagine uh, if you put all your eggs in one basket, I'd, I'd, you know, and you were my friend, I'd, I'd slap you, um, you know, but. Uh, and, and are you going to have your own brand or are you going to just sell it all to other people who want to uh, I think white label it? Yeah, I think it, we're not going to have our own brand this year. Um, I think one of the things I learned about having a brand the last time was that it's just, uh, the most important principles in business are cash flow first, profit second, brand third. Um, and brand is, is arguably the least important decision making process in a con how a consumer buys cannabis today. Um, and so it's, it's um, you know, they'd rather buy quality, exotic name brand, whatever, um, high THC, they don't care who it comes from. They're like an IPA drinker. I mean, how many, how many IPA drinkers do you know that buy the exact same IPA every single week? I, I don't know any. I'm one of them, and I don't buy the same IPA every week. No, it's yeah, no, I, I just always, I, I always go into the store, and I'm just like, let me try something different. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'll cycle back through the same ones. Yeah, that's why, especially even going back to the private investment stuff. Uh, you know, it's really poor, poor investment strategy to invest in one company, um, if you were, because the chances that a consumer, it, the, the brand loyalty that exists in cannabis, well, it just doesn't exist on a on a, on a flower side. Got it. All right. Bam, are you ready to get into the hot seat? And uh, we, we've heard a little bit of the story, which was uh, what, like 2015 to 2017 in the uh, CO2 extract. And by the way, somebody uh, early on in the comments uh, mentioned that they loved your pens and missed them. So oh, I thank you. <laughs> I missed uh, them too. 
<laughs> so, so, yeah. so why, yeah, I mean, why, why don't you, I mean, start, start from wherever you think it's logical to start in terms of telling your kind of business story and, uh, and let's get started. Sure. I mean, as far as my business story goes, I'd say the highest grade was probably like <clears throat> my, my deepest venture into the business side of cannabis. Um, I've been cultivating for a long time. I think my first, my first crop was in like the late nineties. And um, where was that? That was in Massachusetts. What? You're also from Beantown? Get the yes, fuck sir. out. Pat's Represent. fan, Red Sox, Patriots, Celtics. Grew, grew up right outside Fenway Park. Going to ride by BMX in the parking lot. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. So, so your first grow what, what was like a, an HPS grow somewhere in, in... It was actually a fluorescent grow. Uh, I had gone through extreme lengths to, uh, to get a, a closet set up from Canada and uh, also went up to Canada to get my first, my first seeds, which were, which were some AK 47s from, from Holland via Canada. And that was my first run. But then uh, I wound up coming out to California in, in the late two thousands and, and, just growing as a grower. Um, started focusing on breeding. I worked at Coastal Seeds for a while where I cut my teeth. Uh, learning under Kagyu, who's an order breeder. He's been breeding for a long time. And then somewhere along the journey, I stumbled upon CO2. Uh, there was a, a farmer in Santa Cruz who had been making CO2 like wow this is pretty good this is different than some of the other co2 that i had tried on the market and i i i had studied chemistry for a while and i had worked in a lab for a while so analytical mind started getting to it after i tried it and i was like all right these are i see a lot of potential here and room for improvement so i bought myself a little benchtop unit and started doing as many runs as I could possibly do in a day. By the way, who 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 is that guy you see on the screen? That that that, that was my mentor, Kagyu, Michael from Coastal Seeds. And uh he I I remember I was a, a young breeder with uh, not that much experience and probably a little bit arrogant because I was like, hey, I'm starting the seed company. Do you want to join? <laughs> and, and and this is the guy who, who who is twice my age and, and and had been doing it for a lot longer. And I remember taking home an, a, a nug of his and, and, and smoking it. And it was mind blowingly good. And in that moment I had like the epiphany that, you know, maybe I should just humble myself instead of trying to get an older guy to join my seed company. Why don't I go join his company and, and learn, learn the ropes. And so that that's what I did for a while. And, Coastal Seas was always more like a project of passion to me than a, a business maneuver. Um, the highest grade was when I started developing our, our CO2 process, which we call the virgin cold press extract. Um, and, and was that with some friends or, you know, how, what was the, who are the people, the key people? That was me in, in, in a lab, not, not lab, it was my, it was my bedroom with a bench top unit uh, waking up, I, I need to get four runs in a day in order to develop my process. And my machine ran on four hour cycles. So I'd set my alarm and I'd sleep for four hours and I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I'd reload the machine and, 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 then, and, then, and then let it go again and go back to sleep as I was developing my process because I needed to collect as much data as I could um, in order to develop my whole process. And then down the line, I had, I needed money to scale because CO2 equipment isn't cheap. And so I brought on an, uh, an investor slash partner and we got a bigger machine, got into a lab and then tried to go to market uh, and where we had a lot of like success in the award circuit and, and, and but uh, struggled to get our retail sales to, to make us profitable. 
and, 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 and looking back kind of retrospectively, why do you think that was? Several factors. I mean, one, I think, and I, I hate to always do this, but I see a lot of problems with the regulatory framework. Uh, I don't no. believe there should be <laughs> bottlenecks in terms of retail. Like, I, I don't understand why why producers can't take things directly to market. Because I think that if we could take things directly to market, we would have been an extremely successful company. Um, but I, for, for me, the biggest hurdle was getting just shelf space, getting FaceTime for clients. Uh, that was the hardest component. It, there was a lot of cronyism. You had to know so-and-so. And, 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 and you have these different markets that are, are limited, like, I can speak specifically to Santa Cruz because that's where I, I'm based. You know, that there's a monopoly there of like 11 dispensaries that, that have had that chokehold and stranglehold in the market. And anytime you limit consumer choice, uh, you're, it's not just the consumers who, who, are, who are at a disadvantage. Uh, manufacturers and producers are as well because here you have behemoths and, and they are the gatekeepers to the retail market. And the retail market is where revenue is generated. So uh, for us, that was the biggest hurdle. It was, it was always a fight. And it was always about how much could we give up in order to ha gain gain market share. And then you, you couple, couple that with like having to compete with uh, hydrocarbon and extracts and distillate. That's a much cheaper uh, production process. The, co the cost of equipment, I mean, you can spend under $20,000 and have everything that you need to produce a, lo a lot of that stuff. Like I think the cheapest uh, CO2 unit that, that you can buy is the benchtop unit, which is a $35,000 investment. And if you're trying to get into any form of production, I think at, at the time that we were doing things, it was about $100,000 um, for the machine in order to produce, be able to process a hundred pounds a month, working six days a week, um, and and then there's a laboratory overhead too. Again, we this was a like all my projects are projects, are passion projects more so than <laughs> than business. I I like to do what I love more so than focus and and and, and making money isn't isn't my passion. It's a necessity. Um, so I have a question here because this is really important. Meanwhile, despite all these challenges over this time, you have developed a reputation and also a fan base. Is that not correct? I mean, they're out there, aren't they? Sure. Yes, we have. I mean, I, I still get requests all the time about our cards and, 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 and that, that was probably the most meaningful part. Of, of, of the entire thing. It was nice to, I, I love connecting with consumers. I love educating them. I love hearing uh, genuine feedback from people who truly appreciate what it is that, that we had done. But I think the biggest hurdle for me is how do I translate that into a sustainable project? Not just environmentally sustainable, not just uh, con consumer sustainable, but like financially sustainable. And and that was a, a real challenge between, uh, I think it would be even more so of a challenge now under Prop 64 than it was under Prop 215. Um, and to me, the solution is open up the market, like, like stop limiting retail channels, stop, stop limiting uh, producer licenses, and, and, and really give, give people the chance to compete on a level playing ground. And... You know, uh, I, I, I always proud, pride myself on, now I, I'm a naturalized American citizen and, 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 and uh, I always proud myself on, on the idea of the meritocracy, on, on the idea of, of a free market, on, on the idea of, of these principles being the driving factor and that those that excel and do, bet, do the best should prevail. And, that, I think that's my biggest gripe with regulation. The way that regulation is, I'm, I'm not against regulation. Mind you, we were self-regulating way before this. Our standards were smashing cat three. We were already doing that. That was a standard that we had set for ourselves. Um, and so 
it's, it, it was very frustrating. It's frustrating to me to see that, like, in the name of health and safety, uh, you have oligarchies being carved out. And you have, especially in the retail segment of, uh, uh, of the industry, where, and, and I've talked to people in the past, because so obviously as we were growing, I, I had friends who were in, in doing similar type businesses in Colorado and Washington. And I, I was always reasoning with them. How, how do I crack this nut? How do we get this shelf space? How do we break through and, 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 and get onto the open platform? And unfortunately, it sounded a lot like the radio industry. It's kind of a pay-to-play thing. Um, a, a lot of the feedback that I was getting from from other successful people was bud tender nights. You have to like uh, you, you you have to give away merch. You have to, and so again, it comes down to spending more money in order to gain access to the market and for a startup company that's operating on thin margins as is that becomes that becomes a nightmare a hundred percent so so you know my whole dream with the california market and i think what it was before prop 64 was you had thousands of mom and pop growers tincture makers uh you know, everybody was small and hiring their first couple of people. They were passionate. They were excited to be like, holy shit, I may be able to make a career out of what I love. And California, every state and every country gets to create its own vision of, of what a cannabis market gets to look like. Unlike the, you know, I, I'm, drink, I, I'm drinking mids right now. Uh, if you guys can see that, uh, m- mostly because, c- you know, when my wife went to the grocery store, I was, I can't be like, I can't see what beer she's going to buy. I was like, just buy me a 30 pack of Bud Light. Um, but like Bud InBev and Miller Coors dominate all the distribution. They control distribution for alcohol, right? So you have kind of a couple companies controlling everything. If you're a small beverage brand, you know, your aspiration is basically to be bought up by Coca-Cola or Pepsi or InBev or Miller Coors because they control it all. And we, we had a fresh start and we didn't need to go in that direction. And things were moving along nicely. You guys had brands. You were, I mean, obviously you were frustrated, but you were, you were mom and pops starting businesses. And then with Prop 64, basically the guillotine came down and it's going to turn out like every other industry where you're going to have a couple MSOs, multi-state operators dominating, you know, maybe you'll have the retail chain that controls retail. They're going to have purchasing power. They're going to be able to slap around the little guys. That's what MedMen wanted to be. They wanted to own all of California, all of global retail like Starbucks and, and, and squeeze all the other operators. Um, so anyway, and what high times plans to be? Exactly. All right. So carry on. But you know I'm not anti. I'm not anti those people doing what they do. What I'm anti is them preventing us from carving out a space for ourselves. Like, right. okay, great. There's Bud Light, but you know, there's Pete's Wicked Ale, and there's other small companies, and they eventually get bought up. But how did those companies get their start? They started small. They had access to the market, and they were able to take it direct to consumer. And so they were able to actually build their brand on their own. Right. That's. I think that's the dream of most cannabis entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in general uh it's we want to be able to if if, if, if we do the work and and we put in the time then then we should be rewarded uh for 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 that time and effort instead of constantly running into different hurdles and and different roadblocks um and and one one aspect of prop 64 that i really uh and disgruntled about is is the amount of power that's devolved to counties because th- 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 then you really see this th- th- this disproportionate access to the market based on geographic locations uh, th- that come down to local political uh, powers and, and and I was a political science major and and I didn't realize how in my mind it's a form of corruption when you have a few uh, 
a few pe people in, posi uh, um, in positions of power that get to make decisions that, that affect large numbers of, of people's lives. And oftentimes it comes down to not just what is, is legislated, but it's the application of said law. So in my particular case, it's Santa Cruz County, which, which is what I'm talking about. And in Santa Cruz County, you have the, the Board of Supervisors who have come out and said that they're not out to shut down mom and pops. They're not out to do um, uh, just enable big business. But then if you look at the application of the law, which is often, often uh, devolved to lifetime unelected bureaucrats who are put into these positions. And so there's no real way for the voters to check them. There's a disconnect between what was said by the legislators and how that law is, up, law is applied. Um, and, and you see it all across the state. There's different, di you can see the success of different cannabis ventures and startups uh, based on their county. How many, how many huge uh, companies that were operating out of Santa Cruz have now moved to Monterey or moved elsewhere? And that's great and fine and dandy if you're a big company that, that has the revenue and the financial backing. But there's a whole segment of the economy that was homesteaders, such as myself. I, I never wanted to be a hundred acre grow. I've always just wanted to have a small family farm and be able to take my product to the market. I, I would love to see the day when I can just be at the farmer's market, right? I love what I do and I want to continue to do what I do without having to uproot my entire family and move jurisdictions because there's a friendlier location over there. And, and I think that's, yeah, no, I, 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 I had talked to, I mean, I've talked to people who, for example, like moved from Oakland to Sacramento because Oakland was so crazy and they were just like, it's more friend, but I mean, obviously, ideally you wouldn't have to move your entire family just to do what you want to do. That's crazy. Yeah. It's, uh, especially when, when some of us have, have staked our entire lives and built our homes, you know, when people buy a house, it's not. It, it, it's yeah. not a, it's not, it's not a small decision. You know, it's like you put, you, 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 you're investing everything into something and then to have, have some local politics stand in the way of you living your dream uh, it doesn't seem fair to me. I understand. And, and I don't want to like contradict the need for regulation. Again, I'm not an anti regulation person. I just think that regulation needs to be rolled out in a manner that actually addresses health and safety rather than like limiting access to the market. There is a, there's a middle ground. There's a middle ground to be had where we can address the needs and the concerns of different communities without stifling entrepreneurship and, and, and ingenuity. Right. Damn. What, what do you think about Oregon? Because this is one of the things that I've battled with with Prop 64 is that it was done with this guise of protecting small farmers. It was done in all these like, you know, this kind of, um, oh, yeah, we're going to protect the little guy for five years. And then all of a sudden switcheroo, stacking licenses, you know, all this stuff. And then it's like at the end of the day, I've looked at it and been like, you know, it would have been better off if they'd said, all right, you have to show proof of funds five million dollars or else you can't get in. Because you know what, then we all would have just been like, you know what, all right, we're going to stay underground. We're going to screw that, stay underground. Instead, we all like lost, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars trying to become legal to have it stuffed in your face, which I've known a lot of my friends that has happened to. And at the end of the day, it would have been better to just be like, okay, I could have made the choice to you know, not do that. And then you have Oregon that's like, all right, free for all. It was like, instead of this bleeding out of three to four years, like you're seeing in California, it was like, it completely blew up it completely collapsed and price and pounds went no, you know, and then it was just like survival of the fittest raw capitalism. Um, and a lot of people are sour about that, but at the same time, I, I look at it to where, you know, what would have been better for our community? And I don't know what it is. I don't know the answer to it. Um, but at the same time, it's just like what's going on right now for the vast majority of people is not working. It's only working for a select few. I agree, and and right. I think that and then, uh, and, and then o o Oklahoma is another example of a kind of free market, and it'll be interesting to see how. That... Go ahead, Bam. I was saying that, yeah. I mean, I, I think that 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 free for all model is actually what, in my mind, is the fairest. I mean, I, I think that if, if there's a glut in the market, uh, but there's no barriers to entry to the market. For, for for the producers, 
then it's on the producer. And that's where the brand starts moving out of third place on your list and starts yeah. moving into first place because then you start having to connect and, and identifying with consumers and reinvesting in your communities and making those bonds that are important so that people are saying, okay, I have a consumer choice. Why am the market's flooded? Why am I going with this brand? Because this yeah. brand has done the consumer outreach. They've done the education. And, 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 and those are the values that I place high on just culture. Forget business. Yeah, yeah no, culture in general. I agree. Yeah. It's the crazy thing that you mentioned earlier about the farmer's market. There have been so many that are now national and worldwide food, food and agriculture product brands that started at a farmer's market because you got direct you've got direct market info from your customer. You weren't, de you weren't deciphering this market info from a bud tender to a buyer at a club, to a sales rep at a distributor, to then the sourcing at the distributor. And now you've got a game of telephone to you don't even know what your customer wanted or what they said, you know? And when you're at the farmer's market, you can know, pivot quickly on your business model or your product, your strange, whatever it's going to be. And then you can meet your customer's needs. And so that's like, in a lot of ways, like why that farmer's market model is so important and, and why we need it so bad. Well, I think also for a lot of small farmers, if they could just do farmer's markets, they could clear out most of their harvest through mm -hmm. that model and just move on to next season. Because now they're at the mercy of distributors, right? A distributor, I'm, I'm a Humboldt farmer. I can't interact with the end user. I have to rely on a distributor who doesn't care about me. And then I'm in the retail on ramp and the bud tenders don't care about me. And if we could, if I could go to 10 farmers markets a year, I could connect with the person who values my product and is like, I love your shit. Yeah. And, and, and you don't get the situation where the consumer walks in and asks the bud tender, what's your favorite strain? Oh, you know what it is? It's what we have the most of in stock. <laughs> That's that's my favorite strain, the one that that, 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 that we get the most margins on, and, and we need to get rid of today. And and, and, and and I've seen that happen so many times. And and props to all the butt tenders out there that are not like that and actually do their job like a sommelier, because I don't want to take that, anything away from them. There there are great butt tenders out there who really genuinely connect with their consumers, know their products in and out, um, and do that. But then. You also have pressures from like product managers and, and, and retail managers who have to do inventory management and, and inventory management and consumer good seldom line up. They, they just seldom line up in, in, in the way that the market is currently shaped. Um, that doesn't mean that so, it can't so, be altered. So, so talk about your, um, when you, I assume you shut down the, uh, the CO2 vape, pen stuff. So when did you shut that down? And then kind of what was the next pivot? So we shut that down in the summer before Prop 64 kicked in. And it was kind of a so 2017 summer 2017. 17, I believe that's what it was. Summer of uh, 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 June or July of 2017. Um, and was that a was difficult a decision? Or yeah, talk so, about some of them. So yeah, one of the problems was uh, the licensing hurdles. Um, trying to find a jurisdiction that we could get the license. Nobody had their licensing programs rolled out. We were operating in Richmond at the time, and it was very unclear as to how that was going to roll out. So we were struggling with basically finding a location that was going to be ready in time for the transition to prop 64 that that would allow us to to just keep chugging along so so, awesome. this, this, so this was trying to find a type six license a, a, a jurisdiction where you could do type six uh, yeah, like, co2 extraction mm -hmm. uh, and okay. the, the places that were convenient to us and where we had already been operating hadn't worked out their entire framework yet they kept kicking it down the line, saying it's coming online, it's coming online. When you're barely making rent and payroll every month, you don't have time to wait for them to, to make those decisions. Unfortunately, I also got into a really gnarly car accident uh, that left me in a coma for about a month and a half. Um, and so when I came out of it, 
it was kind of chaos. I suffered traumatic brain injury and I wasn't really all together. Uh, some of the investors basically tried to cut me out of the company and it just kind of got ugly from there. And I chose to shadow the brand rather than then fight while I was actually fighting for my mental sanity at the moment. I had three ongoing brain hemorrhages. I wasn't <laughs> in any shape or position to, to get into legal battles or try to navigate the slope. It took me about a year of, of therapy and, and downtime before I could actually put my pick pieces of, of myself back up together. So it was a combination of factors that, wow, that, that wow. led to the shuttering of, of the brand. But uh, we, and, we, and, we and didn't just, have the funding. Let, let me ask a specific question because I feel like in this industry, I've been screwed more than uh, any other industry I've been in. And it's never been by people who were, are legacy in the industry. It's always by kind of newer people. And were the people who were trying to push you out uh, legacy people or kind of like the newer investors? They were legacy stuff? people. Uh, you know, they were legacy people. It was... It was a complicated string of events. It's hard to assign blame. And um, if anything, it's just a sad story um, of, I, if I had to pinpoint it, it was fear. I think that people were, people, me coming out of a coma, me almost dying, me being the heart of the brand, at the put put fear in in, 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 the, in the investors' hearts and they felt the need to take control of their investment, but they did so in a way that was unmindful of my contributions and, and, and the work that I had done. It was my tech. I invented the brand and I did all that basic groundwork, so I wasn't going to be cut out. They weren't bad people. They were legacy people. Fear will lead to bad outcomes. Fear, I think, in general, leads to bad decision making and poor outcomes. And and, and from my, if well, if I had to look at myself, because at the end of the day, if you're analyzing any problem, there's only one person that you can blame. It's yourself because that's the only person that you can control. Um, I would say that. Uh, my reaction to what I felt was like encroachment um, was also probably disproportionate as well and had something to do with it, but I don't take all the blame for it. I, if I had to pinpoint it on one thing, I think it was fear and uncertainty that co the combination of fear and uncertainty led to a, to, a, to a chain reaction of bad outcomes and bad reactions that that wound up multiplying. You know, it's like one one overreaction or miscalculation led to the other overreaction and miscalculation. The kind of like ping ponged in a in a negative feedback loop. I was gonna yeah, I was gonna say feedback loop. Yeah. Bam. So, so, so okay, so so that's 2017. So now what happens next you, you you shut the brand down and focused on my health for a while yeah um, traumatic brain injury is a pretty serious thing um, it's one of those things that nobody can really explain in like one conversation but just imagine losing your brain um, and then having to pick up all the pieces and put it back together um, so after that after i came back out of it uh you know, the breeder me was uh, wanted to continue being a cultivator and a breeder. I continued to run into the different struggles and hurdles in Santa Cruz County, where they spent a lot of time trying to address the mountain community, which is the traditional growing area of Santa Cruz County. But subsequently, most of the legislation that was passed made it almost impossible for anybody in the mountains to, to get a license. Everything was pushed into the traditional berry growing areas of Watsonville and um, a lot of brands left Santa Cruz and uh, a lot of other farmers went rogue and went outlaw. Um, I decided that I was going to focus on breeding and cultivation somehow, some way. And then I was looking at all the hurdles and, you know, by the time 
you deal with conditional use permit and every other agency that wants a piece of the pie before it's even even before the ingredient list has even been put together. Um, it just seemed like a nightmare to me. I, I'm 42 years old. I mean, like, I don't feel old, but I don't feel like I have all the time in the world to waste, um, jumping through hoops and, and playing Simon Says. Uh, and so I, I looked into hemp because in my mind, it's the same plant. And as a breeder, if my focus is something besides THC, there are so many traits within the same plant that I can focus on right now in terms of like structure, uniformity, yield, disease resistance, uh, nose, colors, uh, all the other novel cannabinoids. There are many traits that I can focus on on stabilizing right now and producing that whenever it goes federally legal or nationally legal, if I, if I want to put THC back into it, it's not going to be a, it's not going to be a quantum step to do so. Um, and my, my interactions with the ag department and the CDEFA have been phenomenal. They're an amazing agency. And I found that they, that they were there. I felt like I had partners. And so that's what, one of the reasons why I went down the, the hemp route. There wasn't, I didn't have this antagonistic relationship with the government where I felt everybody was trying to get a piece of the pie before it was baked and everybody was trying to stand in my way and stop me from achieving the goals that I wanted. I felt like I had real partners that are there to assist me in achieving my goals. Um, if I have questions for them and, and I give them examples of things that I want to do, somebody gets back to me within 24 to 48 hours with like concrete answers and they're always coming at it from the perspective of, a, of how can I enable Bam to achieve his goal rather than spending this way? And that was very refreshing for a cannabis farmer to who's, who spent a lifetime having to like uh, live in the shadows and dodge uh, government agency in order to do what, what I think is a basic human right. Um, to, to have a relationship with, with a government agency who cared enough to make sure that they were going to give me the tools that I needed for my success. And um, if I was one of the, one, something struck me the other day. I was actually having a conversation with the Act Commissioner. I, I've been looking, so I'm right now, I have a California nursery stock license to do hemp. As, um, and so I can sell clones and seeds uh, to other people and I can ship all over the country as long as it's hemp. And I had a client that was in another state and I wanted to do everything above board and logistically. And this was kind of a new problem for them. Like hemp is legal. They can, it, it's legal for me to like sell it, move it, do whatever, but there are still steps along the way that, that haven't been clearly defined. And I remember when things were not clearly defined in cannabis, it came down to the regulator or, or the sheriff or whoever they want, whoever it was that you were dealing with, that that, that that interpretation fell upon them. And it was up to you later to clean up the mess that was made or fight or challenge their, their opinion of, of that enforcement. Um, and what I like about working with the CDFA is that they work with you to problem solve it and, 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 and get you the concrete answers and generally their focus is on operating within the spirit of the law and so i had been troubleshooting how to do this logistically every step along the way i felt like i had a partner they would call me up they didn't have the answer they would connect me to somebody else in, in another department that could and it was a collaborative team effort amongst three different people within this within the cdfa and the ag department who were working with me and were even reaching across the aisle to the other state to make phone calls there to make sure that everybody who needed to be on board for, for, for this project was there. And I said to the Ag Commissioner, I said, I just want, and I know that they're understaffed right now under with the COVID crisis, uh, offices are closed. They're having to, to work from home and it, it's just a struggle for them. And so even in all that mess, they're still responding to all my needs within 24 to 48 hours and doing it. And so I said, thank you. I said, thank you so much for being my partner um, and making me feel empowered. And I was just deeply grateful. And I wanted to share that gratitude with, with the commissioner. And 
she said something to me that just moved me. She said, of course. And I said, she said, I, I'm blessed to have uh, a great team and, and we're, 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 you're welcome. We're, we're glad to be here for you. She said, we are public servants. That is our job. It was the first time that I had associated a government worker with the term public servant. I think that was the last time I heard public servant was when my grandparents used to talk about um, government agency. And obviously, I'm coming from the cannabis industry bias. This is where I have been. And so it's very hard having been on the wrong side of the persecution stick for a number of years to see government as, as a partner or a public servant. But it, it felt good to hear that coming from a government agent, that, that, that they were there to assist me and help me in a way that enabled me. And so that's kind of why I'm really enjoying my shift and my transition to hemp, because now I feel like I have a partner who like wants to- Like you're just like, a farmer. I'm just a farmer. That's all right. It. That's all I wanted to be. I just wanted to be a farmer and focus on my work. Like this isn't about um, organized crime or, or minting a bunch of money. It's about a culture. It's about a lifestyle. It's about a, and, and it's, it's refreshing. And so that's kind so, of my favorite. Yeah, can I just add in here? I, I have mixed feelings because after hearing you talk, I can't help but think that hemp's gain is cannabis is loss. Why is that? Because we need you. <laughs> we need people I, like you. Thank you. Well, I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. And like, my, <laughs> like to me, cannabis and hemp are the same thing. And like, I think this is a great opportunity for, for, for like, I need to channel my energy somewhere, right? Like Santa Cruz County has made it impossible for me to like operate within the cannabis space. But can, hemp is cannabis, right? The only difference is that I'm not in the THC realm of things. It's and, all hemp at first. Totally all understand. It, it really is. Well, all, all right. So, 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 so from a specific, uh, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? But basically, when you first decided that you want to go the hemp route, you know, with a 0.3% limit, where did you source your initial stock to play with? So the, my, my germplasm, you didn't I actually have a bunch of 0.3% seeds in your, you did. I didn't have a point, a bunch of 0.3%, but I had a, a an Afghan heirloom that uh, I had received as, as a last gift from my father, um, who had been working in Afghanistan at the time. Um, and I found a variety in there that tests as federally compliant hemp with really high percentage of THC, not the CBD not TAC. And so I had this great stock and it's a unique, it's unique in that m many cannabis varieties will um, move all cannabinoids in ratio. This variety doesn't. The THC caps out and depending on how good you grow the plant, you get a much higher percentage of CBD, whereas the THC stays the same. It locks in at 0.27. Um, it'll produce at a, the highest that I've got it to produce at is a 39 to one ratio where we get it in the 19% CBD range. And then, and then it still stays at 0.27 in terms of um, THC. So that's my foundational stock right there. Um, sourcing genetics. I've been blessed by, we had also been working with some Panama red when we were at coastal seeds and that had a large number of high CBD varieties. And so I'm registered for both as a research institute for my my hemp breeding as well as a production. Everything that goes in my production field feels has to be below 0.3. In my research field, um, in my research space, it's it's okay if something tests uh, a little bit hot, as long as I'm continuing to work on selection that is working towards stuff that won't test hot. None of that can ever come to market, so I have to destroy anything that is uh, above 0.3 THC. But that doesn't mean that I have to destroy the seed, right? The seed that's often, because as long as I'm working that line and continuing the progress towards producing it, I can keep it in that research space and continue to work towards that. And then when I've actually achieved the research goals, then I can move it into the production fields for, for production. 
So I have I have a, a lot of freedom to to work towards those cultivars. And there's also the generosity. Instagram's a great place. Uh, there are a bunch of people who, who know about the journey that I'm making and the transition who have had seeds and have sent me seeds or given me seeds. And, and, and I met somebody who gave me some feral seeds. They, they, they'd gone out to Nebraska. They'd found it in the field. And so it's just a lot of it's community. Where, where, where has all this stuff ever come from? from the culture and the community that exist and, and the networks that we have and the kindness of different people's pe collectors and breeders out there in the field. And so shout out to everybody out there who's doing their part to preserve and share seed. Um, it's so important that we, that we keep our germplasm open and that, and that we continue to share. Dan, what's, I had a question. What, uh, I was, before you even mentioned that, I was going to ask you, um, what is you, who is your favorite, um, you know, genetic house right now, and what are they working on that you should have, you know, are excited about to see what what's going to come to fruition out of? My favorite genetic house is. I don't know that I have a favorite genetic house. You know, mm -hmm. I think I, I think I really like I really like the work that like Bodhi does from Bodhi Seeds. He, uh, I like the Myrica Seed Trust. I like the fact that he like makes a lot of like land race genetics open to the people. I, I love Mean Gene's work. He crushes it. All of his stuff is fire. Um, I have different favorites for different reasons, you know. But in general, those that are out there sharing seed and and, and pushing the boundaries and trying to like make things open and don't come from the hoardy mentality yeah. or, or or like the ego mentality are. are are the ones that I, I really have the most respect for. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm hoarding a bunch of Bodhi seeds uh, of his uh, Iranian uh, uh, snow lotus crosses. So nice. if, you ever, if you ever want to mess with those, let me know because they're just sitting in my freezer right now. Uh, I so appreciate it. Favorite strain. So uh, I, ever since I, I saw that he had those on the list, uh, I think I bought I bought a lot of packs in uh, 2017 Emerald Cup. Oh, anything, anything that was crossed with the sky lotus or the snow lotus, I, I, I picked up. So, you know, a lot, a lot of the guys who have got my germplasm from and who I really have umpteen respect for right now are not even famous breeders. They're, they're just guys that have like followed me on Instagram and, and they hit me in the DM and say, Hey, I have this. You want it? And I'm like, hell yeah, score, you know, like it, it, it's really the generosity of the community that that, that, that has, has helped me to, to continue on my journey. So props to all you out there in the community doing your part, you know, like that's that's the fuel to my fire. So what's what's your uh, your business vision for the hemp? breeding or is it like are you going to be planting fields yourself or do you want to just be a breeder and selling seeds to other people so yeah right i think i, I want to focus on being a breeder in a nursery i love to cultivate but until the regulations start to come more into what i would consider normal ag um i don't see myself planting huge fields of flower um i also have I also wonder about the viability of the CBD market as, as um, hundreds and hundreds of acres come into production. What I really see as is value added products, you know? So it's like, what are you gonna do with that CBD? Uh, and, and, and focusing on, on formulations that, that work with other um, bioavailable compounds from different plants and, and, and putting together winning combinations for people. Um, in the CBD space, I particularly happen to really love caffeine mixed with CBD. I think it's an amazing combination. Um, and so I, I am working with, with, with a farmer right now to produce our own um, CBD infused coffee. Um, but yeah, for me personally, on, on the cultivator tip, I want to focus on using my research base to develop um, coastal hardy hemp varieties and ideally unlock the potential of different cannabinoids and be able to produce seeds. Look, I, I have a small family farm 
we have two acres of production, right? Am I ever going to compete with 5,000 acres of, of hemp? Uh, no, but guess what? I can empower 5,000 acres of hemp. On, on my two acres, how many pounds can I grow? I'm not com producing 10,000 pounds on my two acres, but I could produce 2 million seeds, 3 million seeds. And um, if I focused on, on, on producing high quality seed that can that can be used on, uh, in, in larger scale agriculture. I think that's like a niche that I can carve out for myself and still enjoy the work that I love, which is working with the plants. And... Uh, Bam, uh, aren't a lot of those uh, large hemp farms coming online uh, in Kentucky as well, being brought online by people who've never grown hemp or, or cannabis before? So I'm wondering, is there also an opportunity for you to, uh, you're not growing it yourself, but help and help them grow the best hemp they possibly could? Sure, yes. Uh, and, and I'm open to doing co consultations. Uh, I have done a number of, of interviews at, for, with, with different companies to do consultations. But I think a lot of times, um, at least what I've seen in my experience is that, is that, a lot of these, a lot of these new new starters don't don't see the value in, in the wisdom that a lot of us growers uh, possess. They're, I'm sure that there are some out there, but uh, if I had to say, out of like the numerous interviews that I've gone to, maybe two people I've actually done, and and and, and, and the rest are just you. You don't want to work for fifteen dollars an hour? No, I'm sorry, I don't want to travel. Uh, 2,000 miles to work for $15 an hour when I live in California, which is like, it's not going to cover the basic, the basic needs. Um, I, I, I would, I, I think that the best way that I can actually do that is make their lives easier by producing hardy strains. Like my winter focus was 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 on producing cold hardy selections that were going to survive rough weather patches. If I could produce a seed that they pop, it's going to do well. And it's a no brainer. I'm already empowering them. I'm already helping the uninitiated, unbeknownst to them. They, 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 like, if I can produce a seed that's going to do well in in in, in, uh, in rough conditions and still give a good result, I think that that has more power of reach than me doing individual consultations with uh, with any any specific company. And honestly, like my passion is to stay with the plant and work with it and grow it myself. Advising is cool. I, I like to do educational seminars and types types of things. And I think maybe if that was kind of like my goal, I'd focus more on doing a, a, a blog or, or or a video channel and give out that information for free. But the service that I want to produce is to produce sustainable seeds that lead to sustainable outcomes. So just quickly, someone asked in the chat, how do I get a hold of your CBD seeds, your, essentially your hemp seeds? Uh, I can be reached at info at stockandbean.com. Stock and Bean is, uh, is the name of my cultivar development company. And, okay. uh, we, we'll be selling our seed at, at the Regenerative, Regenerative Seed Company. I think it's regenerativeseedco.com. Um, that's probably the first place that I'll be releasing any of our seed. Yeah. Okay. Now tell, tell me uh, one or two lessons you learned from Kagyu, like about breeding and cannabis and genetics and cultivation. Two lessons that I've learned from Kagyu. What did Yoda teach you? Oh, man. It's, it's a good question. It's a, I think he taught me how to humble myself. <laughs> that was a, 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 a really big lesson. And, and um, I can't recall any specific tech, how to collect pollen. Uh, he showed me a couple different techniques on how to collect pollen. Uh, Respect for the plant, respect for the lines. A, a, a lot of the technique that I've learned in terms of like 
technical aspect. I learned out of books and I, I went to the UC Davis plant breeding Academy, and a, a lot of that stuff, but it was more just like mentorship, like, like wisdom, sharing ideas, having that mind who gave me perspectives on history. You know, he, he, he had been growing in the Santa Cruz mountains since the seventies. And, and, and sometimes it's just, it's pieces of wisdom more so than, than knowledge, you know, and like wisdom is like the experience of having used that knowledge. Uh, 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 and so as I would encounter different things, just having that ear uh, of somebody who'd been through it and known that I could share and bounce the ideas off of and then hear, hear his different experience help to inform and shape my experience. Right. Right. All right. So, so we are, we are already after four. So I wanted to throw one piece of red meat as a topic into the conversation. Then we can call it a wrap. And that is, uh, Appalachian it's coming. Uh, so Sam, we're going to start with you because you had some thoughts on Appalachian and you're, you're growing in native soil in Lake County. So you could have the Lake County Appalachian. So let's talk Appalachian. Um, so I guess, first of all, I, some of you guys have probably heard me talk. So I've, I've, spent on, I've been on a lot of pa panels with Frenchie um, and, uh, you know, Justin and a few other people. Um, one, of my, one of my main things about Appalachians is like, if you, if you look at the French system and you look at the United States system, the French system is about an insane amount of control. Um, and it's also, you know, it attempts to tell the consumer what is a good product. And it's, a, and it's about cultural pre preservation on methodology. Um, and, and that methodology is kind of hindered on, on, on zero change. Um, but in the marketplace, it's, 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 it's reasoning is to attempt to tell the consumer what is good and what is bad. Um, the United States system is kind of goes along with, you know, in the United States culture and laissez-faire, uh, capitalism. Um, and it lets the consumer decide, uh, what is good quality. Um, and what, uh, with that comes, um, you know, a lot of issues. Uh, and so when you have a, a lot of people saying, Hey, we want like a French system for cultural preservation yet. Um, we want to call our, we want to say that we have terroir and we're, you know, we're rocking in, um, in, you know, happy frog soil. Um, we're in a greenhouse. Um, you know, those things are autonomous to what terroir is. I'd argue. And then with, with the United States, great, you know, with the, the grape, uh, viticulture areas, that if you use Roundup, you can't claim an app. You, you can't. You shouldn't be able to claim an Appalachian or a terroir because Roundup kills the microbiome of the soil. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm not saying the United States system is perfect or better, or, or you know, but I also don't think that what a lot of these, um, a lot of people are trying to instill in Cal the California Appalachian system uh, for for cannabis. Um, you know, they want to say, oh, well, you know, we've, we've worked with the soil for 20 years and it's regenerative and, and such. And it's like, yeah, but it's still not native soil. It's still not native soil. Um, and so my, my kind of two uh, thesis points of, of California cannabis Appalachians are 100% native soil, less than 2% by volume inputs. Um, and I've, I've written comments to uh, CDFA about this when they were just doing their, their thing. And then also um, that there can be no uh, no covering between you and the, you and the sun. If you actually want to be uh, to actually declare yourself an Appalachian, um, you know. Another thing is like I, I just don't think that unfortunately consumers care about it right now. It's going to matter in ten or twenty years for sure. Um, but right now, there's such a select few people that actually uh, care about it. I assume Frenchie would agree with what you just said, right? D does he disagree with any of that? I, I always feel like his, his, when his, you know, veins start popping, it's when people are calling something Appalachian that isn't what the French definition of Appalachian is. Well, their, their side of it's like, uh, I think a little bit more on like, you have to, um, they want to have extreme control. Like, sorry, if, who, who, who's they, the French? Uh, no, there's, there's people in the, in, in the cannabis community that they want to say, Hey, you can't grow long Valley Kush outside of Waitonville and call it, you know, and call it, uh, you know, the, the and, and use that destination of, of the name or, the, you know, they want to use different strain, uh, 
uh, issues like that. But then there's also a lot of folks. I mean, I've I've stood, I've argued with someone in San Francisco about how their their different warehouses of indoor had different appellations. <laughs> I'm not I'm not kidding. Like someone legitimately tried to argue that point to me um, because of you know, and I was just kind of like, what? You know, so there's just a lot of folks that I think the biggest one to me um, that the can that most of the cannabis where I differ than most of the cannabis community is is soil um, that you can't I don't think you can be able to um, use any import soil uh, whatsoever and still call yourself an Appalachian or you know or even necessarily designate a county of origin without having native soil. But it also has to be in the ground. Yep. Yep. But terroir I mean, also encompasses so much more than just the soil. It also it also encompasses the people and the culture and the practices of the people that are cultivating it. And I think that often gets lost. And I'm not taking away anything from what you're saying. But if you want to get down to like the argument about like the the, the warehouses in San Francisco, there's a culture behind that. There's a culture and that there are people behind that. And and they definitely influence it because you plug and play and take some growers from Sacramento and put them into the same warehouse, it's going to change the outcome. And, and, and so th there, there are arguments to be made for an Appalachia of the different neighborhoods, especially when you consider the people that are involved. And I think that's one of the most important aspects of, of an Appalachia or terroir is the people. It's, it's the relationship between the, the people that are cultivating and the plants that helps to define to define. We're not talking about land race here. We're not talking about plants in the wild. We're yeah. talking about plants that, 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 that undergo a daily interaction with the workforce and, 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 and the cultural practices. And if you want to get back to the French uh, definition of Appalachia, my, one of my issues with, with, with them is a lot of that stuff was said in the 1700s. They're yeah. like, okay, if you're in this section of soil, now you're grand cru. And if you're yeah. over here, you're such and such. And, and, and that and takes away from the here. terroir of the people that are building the soil. When I when I got my property, it was all clay. I built hugel culture beds. I did permacultural practices. I did chopped and dropped. And I turned a lot of my clay into loam. And so is it native soil? It's natively built soil, right? And, and, and if I can do that in five years, how is it that in 300 years, Everybody who was still grand crew back then is a grand crew right now because of a map that was defined way way back then. And that's something I don't want to see. Yeah, no, happen. I agree with that. I agree with that because that's that's uh, yeah. You, who developed those maps? It was like the large landowners, the kings and the queens, the oligarchy of that time. Um, and you know, I guess the the one thing that I'd say we disagree on is the fact that I um, the culture side of it of people. It, you know, you can either classify ter terroir through science, or you can classify it through a cultural aspect. And one of the things that a lot of, you know, in order to designate a, uh, your own AVA in, in, in the United States, you have to prove scientifically that it has a, that the, the, the climate and the soil and everything around it leads to a different outcome in the end product. And um, one of the issues with the cultural side of it is that, yeah, there's methodologies of, of such that could lead you to, you know, but if it's not, if you take a person out of it and it's not repl replicatable in the same place, then it wouldn't really have terroir in that location. It's, then it's just an entire a, a humanistic um, aspect of it. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I think that, I think that, that you can you can break down the culture into a scientific level, the, the, the methodology and the practices of the people that are are working it has a very scientifically describable and measurable effect and impact on the plant. Yeah, I, I I could I could see that. If, you know, I think back to your statement earlier about um, you know uh, soil building. Um, that's a very different level of soil building than say. Um, you know, adding 10% perlite to your native soil. Sure. Right? And that's, <laughs> that's my problem that I have with, you know, well, we're, we, we started with the, with, you know, 20 years ago, we got a truckload of, 
an ancient forest and that's what we started with and now it's regenerate you know it's a very different thing than actually um you know going through uh, biodynamic methodologies on your own property with everything from your property it's a very different um aspect i think one thing about like um for instance i guess my you know we we're talking about a lot earlier about um you know just the, the regulatory burden and the regulatory framework what i don't like about what a lot of um what a lot of people in the cannabis industry are advocating for with appellations is an essentially a whole entire other regulatory framework that you have to operate within to try to get some market viability. Um, and that is where I'm kind of like, wait, I got to do all these set of rules and all these set of rules. Now I'm supposed to do all those set of rules that, that I don't necessarily agree with all of them. I think it's, um, it's a hard, um, that's a hard sell for me when, when people are asking for an extremely uh, high regulatory burden just to claim an appellation. So if you want to get I the think, organic certification and the appellation designation, you got a lot of regulatory hurdles to, to jump through. For the record, I'm doing both of those. I'm going to do both of those. So just, just you know, I'm, I'm going to go through the hoops to do it because I believe in it. Um, but at the same time, um, I, I hope that it's not so cumbersome that, you um, it makes it, you know, a really hard business decision. I hope it's an easier business decision and an easier to sell to my partners. Well, I think one thing that's really important not to get lost here in this part of the conversation is the fact that regulation is actually leading to the death of appellations that had already existed before there was any like ABA or any board to dictate that. And I'm seeing that right here in Santa Cruz County. Yeah. Um, like, the traditional growing areas where the culture has existed, where the blue dream has come from, where all these other old Blixer holy weed and, 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 and a lot of other old strains were founded and based are being eradicated by conditional use permits and zoning regulations that uh, don't align with health and safety or, um, or, 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 or cannabis and just, they have to do with other agendas, but that's the silent killer of, of, of existing Appalachia. And I can only speak firsthand about Santa Cruz County because that's what I live. And, and I hate to like keep bringing it back to Santa Cruz County, but that's my frame of reference because that's, that, that, that's where I'm at. And I know that there's growers in Calaveras and growers in Nevada County and Yuba who are all experiencing different forms of uh, uh, of barriers and it's, it's the same about the tragedy the yeah. tragedy for us to lose these these heritage terroirs to things like f1 permits yeah whatever you call them the tragedy is losing them yeah exactly yeah all right. Well, gentlemen, on that, uh, we just passed 420. I got a five-year-old uh, who I promised to go rollerblading with. So we will wrap on the, the Appalachian conversation. I appreciate your time and your stories and uh, have a great weekend. Thanks for having Good us. Good being with all you guys. Thank you.